For what is civilization but the perfecting of civil life? The development of society properly so called of the relations of men among themselves. And on what foundations does proper constitutional life rest? Save the right determination of the boundaries of the sovereigns, prerogative, and the accurate definition by law of the people's liberty or power. If then I commence this account of our own social and political life with some remarks upon the utter destruction of the old Roman national life, and spirit in Europe, I shall, I think, be able to show sufficient reason. Rome. Rome, as we all know, maintained its hold of power in Gaul down to the 5th century of the Christian era, and for many years from the date of the conquest of Britain by Julius Caesar established its rule and its laws there. Yet neither in Gaul nor in Britain was that hold permanently retained, and so far as our own country is concerned, nothing is left to mark the Roman conquest, save some few remains of roads, of old buildings, some infusion of Latin terms in our language, and some infusion of Roman law in our own system of jurisprudence. I shall attempt to describe how this came to pass. What were the Saxon customs that superseded in England the Roman rules, and how the Norman conquest of England displaced both the Roman and the Anglo-Saxon institutions? And here let me say that I shall base this part of my subject very much on the writings of an eminent French historian, Monsieur Guissot, whose History of Civilization and Essays on the History of France have thrown so much light on a subject that was not free from obscurity till he took it in hand. And if at the same time I take as my authorities Sir Francis Palgrave, Professor Freeman, and Bishop Stubbs, I shall be referring to authors than whom no better or abler can be found that I know of. It may, of course, be asked, and it is not an unnatural query why, if the Roman conquest of Britain left so little to show for itself so far as habit of life and local customs and institutions were concerned, should our attention be should our attention be direct should our attention be directed to the old Roman world? My answer is for the following reasons: first, in the story of social development. At that period of time when Rome was supreme, in the great part, first in the story of social development at that period of time when Rome was supreme, in the greater part of Europe, we have the idea of corporate municipal life worked into shape. The government of Rome was the aggregate of institutions suited to a population confined within the walls of a city, in other words, of municipal institutions, and as with Rome in the early times, so with Italy. What you find is a confederation of Latin towns. At this period of the early life of Rome, as in the days of the empire, there was no country life, such as we understand the term. The proprietors of the lands were the inhabitants of the towns. They went out to superintend their country properties, taking with them a certain number of slaves. But inhabited country in the proper sense of the term, did not exist. And so it was that the history of the conquest of the world by Rome is a history of the conquest and foundation of a great number of towns. In the later imperial period, in Gaul and in Spain, you find nothing but towns. Therefore, what the social history of Rome exhibits is the non-existence of the country, the extreme preponderance of towns and the municipal character strongly impressed upon them. But then, secondly, in addition to the municipal system which Roman civilization has stamped upon later European civilization, another element is visible. I mean a general and uniform civil legislation and the idea of absolute power, of absolute rule. 
From the municipal system is derived the principle of freedom, from the absolute power of the imperial ruler, that of order and subjection. Then, thirdly, from the Roman imperial legislation, we get another element of civilization, one that stands between their own municipal system and that of the Middle Ages, that which M. Guizot terms the municipal ecclesiastical system. For the preponderance of the clergy in the, affairs, in the affairs of the city succeeded that of the old municipal magistrates and preceded the organization of the modern municipal corporation. The consequence of this upon the formation of modern social life was the introduction of a moral influence the presence and maintenance of a higher law than that of mere brute force or absolute unrestrained rule and the separation of the temporal and the separation of the temporal and the separation of the temporal and spiritual power it was in effect the source of liberty of conscience based upon the principle that physical force should have neither right nor influence over conviction and over truth. In the fourth place, some writers, notably Sir H. Maine, in his work on ancient law, ascribe to the Roman rule of, empithe of empitheusis that double ownership of land which was afterwards visible in the Frankish and Lombardic nations, whereby the military service of their followers was secured by granting away portions of their military dominion and allowing, and allowing benefices, benefices and allowing benefices to become hereditary. Sir Henry thinks, not without a fair show of reason, that these foreign invaders by whom feudalism was founded took at their model the terms on which the agri -limitro limitrophi were occupied by the veteran soldiers of the Roman army, who were disposed along the line of the Rhine and the Danube, and by whom the frontiers of the empire were secured against its, bar its barbarian neighbors. He also thinks that the duty of respect and gratitude to the feudal superior by the endowment of his daughter, the equipment of his son, by the liability to his guardianship of the vassal's son during minority, were literally borrowed from the, relation, the relations of patron and freedmen under Roman law. This contention, possible and even probable as it may be, is not free from doubt. Craig, in his Jus Feudale maintains strenuously that feudal institutions are entirely independent of Roman notions, and Mr. Hallam, in his work Europe During the Middle Ages, warns us against laying too much stress on seeming analogy and hesitates to discover in the Roman relations of patron and client and in the tenure of the frontier lines a complete of the frontier lands a complete analogy with the feudal tenure of lands and with feudal duties. It is not my task to examine the question here at length. I may have an opportunity further on to revert to it again when I trace the different stages of the feudal system of tenure from the allodial and the beneficiary down to that of feuds. Still, as Mr. Hallam says with truth, the preparatory steps in the constitutions of the declining empire are of considerable importance not merely as analogies, but as predisposing circumstances, even germs to be subsequently developed. The fifth, and last the fifth and last reason for drawing attention to the old Roman world is derived from the undoubted influence of Roman civilization and Roman law upon the customs and life of the barbarian invaders of the Roman Empire. If I were to speak of the toleration of Roman institutions shown by the barbarian invaders of Italy and Gaul, whom by a strange perversion of terms style themselves the guests of the Roman people, I should be using too mild a word. The dominant influence of Roman social life would, I think, be correct, would be, would, I think, be the correct expression. Look, for instance, at the Comunitorium Timoteo, 
V.S. Komiti. The mandatory letter of King Alaric to his, com to his comms. Note the Roman term retained in later times in the title count, as the Roman term dux has been preserved in that of duke. What do we find? The king's deliberate declaration of the value of the Roman system of jurisprudence to the well-being of the community. Examine the contents of this breviarium a la Ricianum and that of the Lex Romana Burgundionum. What do we find? A positive recognition of the social distinctions of the Romans, e.g. the Roman cavitas and latinitas, the power of the master over the slave, the patria potestas, guardianship forms of marriage, etc. Though, by the way, no reference is made to or notice taken of patronal rights. As to the direct influence of the Roman law, let me shortly point out where this is visible. Take, for example, the Edict of Theodoric, the Alaricianum Breviarium and the Lex Burgundionum or Papiani Responsa. It is not within the scope of these lectures to dwell upon the incidents of Theodoric's reign or on his character. Those who wish to inform themselves on these points will find full information in the 39th chapter of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. I would only note these words of Gibbon. His reputation may repose with confidence in the visible peace and prosperity of our reign of 33 years, the unanimous esteem of his own times and the memory of his wisdom and courage, his justice and humanity, which was deeply impressed on the minds of the Goths and the Italians. It was somewhere between the years A.D. 493 and A.D. 526 that his edict was promulgated during which period he reigned from the Alps to the extremity of Calabria, adding also to his government Roitia, Noricum, Dalmatia, and Pannonia, and establishing his authority from Sicily to the Danube, from Servia or Belgrade to the Atlantic. The object of the edict, of the edict which was published at Rome through Ravenna was the seat of the royal power, was to fuse into one homogeneous whole as far as possible, the political relations of the Romans and the Goths. It was an attempt to regulate, on a common basis, the social life of the natives and the newcomers, and while, by its enactments, resting exclusively on the principles of Roman procedure, such international combination was protected. Provision was properly made for unforeseen cases by allowing each set of people to refer to their own special laws when such cases arose. Therefore, though as a general rule, the edict was the primary system of law, particular Roman doctrines or Germanic customs might be appealed to. The sources of this edict were the Theodosian Code, the Theodosian and post-Theodosian Novelae, and the codes of Gregory and Hermo Hermogenianus, from the fragments of the edict that have come down to us, it appears that the work consisted of four parts. The first, in two books, is an epitome of Gaius's institutions upon certain parts of the law relating to persons and that relating to things. The second part, termed Fragmentum Papiani, Papiniani, is on the subject of pacts, i.e. agreements, between husband and the third part is a transcript in 13 books of the Codex Gregorianus, on which nine are lost, and the fourth part is an extract from the Codex Hermo Hermogeniani, of which only the fragmentary title have survived. The Breviarium Alaristianum was the enactment of Alaric, the king of the Visigoths. His kingdom extended over a great part of southern Gaul and of Spain, and the royal city was Toulouse. The events of his reign, if one were discussing the history of our Teutonic conquerors, would present topics of no little importance, because it was then that the Frankish invasion of Gaul settled the fate of that part of Europe. And because, by the defeat and death of Alaric, A.D. 507, in the neighborhood of Poitiers, the Gothic dynasty came to an end, and the first of the Merovingian kings, Clovis, firmly establishes power in Gaul, founding an empire that has exercised 
no little influence on our own country.